Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of In-Depth D&D Guides. This is the show that kind of started by accident because I uh, really like playing monks, and I know in 5th edition a lot of people uh, play them uh, incorrectly or, or don't understand how to play them, and so I made this guide and everybody liked it. So uh, I started doing it uh, for other things and, and, you know, for subclass and stuff like that. And everybody liked it and people wanted more of it. So that's what, uh, that's what this is. Um, what I'm, uh, the class I'm going to be going uh, into uh, this time is uh, probably the class that, that gets the least amount of love and yet is one of the most used classes in the game. Um, and it's because this class is kind of incorrectly perceived as being um, a, a very simple, basic, boring class to play. Uh, and it's not. It's actually uh, one of the most customizable, one of the most interesting classes. You, you quite literally can create a character um, that works any way you want it to, to be honest. Um, and that class is the fighter. Uh, the fighter has been around since uh, D, uh, basic D and D. Um, for those of you that are that are unaware, um, as as much as this is the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons, there's actually six versions of it. Um, uh, and depending on, on how technical you want to get, you could technically say that, uh, the advanced versions and the basic versions are, are slightly different, but whatever. Um, D and D basic was the original thing that Gary Gygax came up with. Uh, and then it turned into first edition when they started publishing it, you know, in, in, uh, for real, and, and, and it really started getting traction. Uh, D&D Basic was uh, interesting in things like Elf was a class, not a race. Um, things like that. Fighter has been around since that. And um, in most D&D editions, there, there are uh, two things that kind of define fighters. One, they hit things with weapons. Uh... That's true about all fighters. It's true about the fifth edition fighter. Um, it's just that's what they do. They hit things with weapons. Uh, sometimes it's swords. Sometimes it's bows. Sometimes it's big, you know, heavy axes, whatever. But they hit things with weapons. Thus the name fighter. Uh, the second thing that's been kind of uh, a defining feature since uh, probably about second edition uh, is they get the ability. Um, to uh, customize themselves a little bit more than most um, through additional feats in third uh, edition. I can't remember what they got in fourth edition. Um, in second edition, they got additional proficiencies, uh, things like that. So, so again, instead of getting complicated abilities or spells or anything like that that re require... Uh, learning new things. Fighters were really designed to do one thing uh, well since their inceptions. They they fought. Um, and you kind of had two different kinds of fighters in general. You had what a lot of people refer to as sword and board, uh, where you'd have a sword and a shield, and you were, you were a meat shield. You were designed to just take hits uh, and, and be the person that stepped in front of danger f for your party. Um, and then you had uh, the uh, more damaged focused ones where they would, you know, take, you know, uh, big great swords or, or things like that. And they'd be the ones that would rush into battle. And as D&D &D kind of evolved, um, aspects of the fighter uh, kind of changed and reverted off to different classes. The fighter that would go in with a big old sword swinging and stuff like that eventually turned into um, the barbarian. Um, the fighter that would, you know, stay back and shoot, uh, arrows and stuff like that eventually kind of evolved into the ranger and the dual wielding fighters eventually evolved into, uh, the ranger as well. And so the fighter was basically left with sword and board, 
Um, and that's what most people think of when they think of fighter. Ooh, I'm going to go in, I hit things, and then I make sure they don't hit back. Um, and that's really not what it is in 5th edition, though you can play it that way. Um, and it is a really nice class for beginners, because unlike the monk, where you have to understand more than just your character, you have to understand action economy, you have to understand the abilities of your other party members, uh, depending on the version of fighter that you build, you can just focus on me hit things with stick uh, and still have a great time. They are really designed for that. But to really get the full uh, usefulness out of the class, uh, you need to really understand what it was that the fighter um, was designed to be, which is um, a super customizable um, uh, warrior that relies on his weapon, um, is what it is. Because of that, there are so many other things that you can add on to it, and, and there's so many ways you can modify and change it that um, you can make a fighter to turn into just about anything. And that's the other thing it's designed, uh, the fighter in 5th edition is designed for, is to be highly customizable. You can make the exact character you want to make being a fighter, whereas you can't do that with a lot of other classes because their abilities really shine only in certain situations. So uh, let's start off with um, the first thing that fighters uh, get. Um, this is uh, something that happens in a couple other classes. Paladins get uh, a shorter version of this. Rangers get a sh shorter version of this. Uh, and I think there's a couple other classes that get it. Uh, but the first thing they get to choose is what's called a fighting style. Um, fighting style is basically, uh, it's a way for you to start customizing your fighter right away. Um, so you can go, okay, this, this is kind of how I want to pl pl play my fighter. Um, I'm going to real quick go over the different fighting styles. The nice thing about the fighters specifically is they get access to all the fighting styles, whereas paladins are, uh, they don't, uh, they don't get all of the fighting styles. I think rangers are another one where they only get a few of the fighting styles. Um, uh, fighters get all of them. So, um, the first one is archery. You get a plus two bonus to attack rolls you make with ranged weapons. Um, very simple, very straightforward. If you want to be a ranged fighter, uh, you can be, and it's, uh, you take the archery thing and it makes it that much easier for you to hit. Um, because the fighter, uh, gets more attacks, um, than any other class, um, technically even monks, um, if it's, uh, if the fighter is dual wielding, they will get five attacks where a monk can get a maximum of four, uh, without getting crazy like drunken monk. Um, so, um, the fact that you get to hit more often, you have a, a higher chance of hitting, uh, is really, really useful uh, if you're going to be a ranged fighter uh, and dexterity based. Um, the next one is defense. While you're wearing armor, you get plus one bonus to AC. This is, again, just to make you harder to hit for that meat shield kind of fighter. Uh, the fighter gets the second highest hit die in the game. They get a D10 hit die. So you're going to have some of the highest hit points in your party. Even if you are a ranged fighter, it's going to be in your party's best interest for people to try to attack you. Uh, and so the defensive fighting style is specifically designed for people that want to um, uh, they they want to be the one that's that's drawing attacks and things like that. Um, again, thinking of that action economy, making bad guys waste their attacks on you with a 19 or a 20 AC compared to your friends who only have a 15 or a you know, 16 AC. Um, uh, the, the next one is a really unique one that a, a lot of people don't think about nearly as much as they should. Uh, the fighting style is called dueling. Uh, and it's when you are wielding a melee weapon in one hand and no other weapons, you get a plus two bonus to damage rolls with that weapon. Now, most people will see this and they will think, oh, then I, I, I have to use a single weapon uh, and my other hand has to be free. 
that's not the case. It can be, and with some of the archetypes you can get for the fighter, uh, it's actually beneficial to have a free hand. However, it specifically says uh, melee weapon in one hand and no other weapons. Uh, a shield is not a weapon. It is technically a piece of armor that you wield. Um, so if you want to be that sword and board fighter, but you want to do more damage, taking the dueling feat means you can still use your shield. You can still be very difficult to hit, but you get to do extra damage every time you attack. And again, fighters get, uh, by the time they get to the, uh, um, by the time I think they hit either, uh, 18 or 20, I can't remember what it is. I'll tell you in a little bit here. Uh, or I can turn the page and tell you specifically. Uh, yeah, uh, at 20th level, they have four attacks. So with the dueling um, ability, if you hit with those four attacks, that is an additional eight damage per turn on top of the other stuff like that. And that's a lot of things, uh, that's something that a lot of people don't th think about uh, with, with multiple attacks, is the idea that flat modifiers, things like Hunter's Mark, when you start getting more and more attacks or hex, when you start getting more and more and more attacks, um, that starts to really uh, ramp, uh, uh, ramp up because um, like with Hunter's Mark, every time you hit with a weapon attack, you get an additional D6 of damage. You hit four times, that's an additional four D6 of damage every turn with dueling that's an additional it's a flat number but it's still that's an additional eight damage per turn you know these are all things that stack up and and when you look at the fact that fighters are built to just be able to attack over and over and over with their weapons uh and one of their uh things that you get at second level i'll uh actually affects that greatly um it uh that's that's kind of the thing that you have to focus on is that, yeah, two damage doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when you multiply it by three or four attacks or six or eight attacks when you start dealing with Action Surge, which we'll talk about in a little bit, it makes a massive difference. It really, really does. Um, the next one is really, really popular uh, for fighters that just want to be the guy that does the most damage. Um, it's called Great Weapon Fighting. Um, when you roll a one or a two on a damage die from an attack you make with a melee weapon that you're wielding with two hands, you can re-roll the die and must use the new roll, even if the roll is a one or a two. Weapon must have the two-handed or versatile property for you to gain this benefit. So this is, if you're using a two-handed weapon, you, um, uh, you can re-roll ones and twos. This is particularly useful on things like, um... Uh, which one? I think it's the great sword. I'm gonna check just to be on. Yeah, it's the great sword. Um, great sword does two d six damage. Um, with great weapon fighting, if you use a great sword, um, if you're using um, a a great axe, it's one d twelve damage. Two d six damage. Technically, maximum damage is the same. It's it's twelve damage. But the fact that you're rolling two die instead of one means with great weapon fighting, there is twice as likely a chance that you could roll a one or a two and you can re-roll it. So great weapon fighting works really, really well with a great sword. Um, and uh, again, it's, it's simply a way to increase your damage even more. That's what that's specifically designed. And then again, with the fact that fighters get multiple attacks, that's a defining feature of the fighter. Uh, this is just adding on more and more and more and more damages, turning ones into fours or you know twos into sixes um, over and over and over again is a big deal. So um, that's really where great weapon fighter shines. Um, protection: When a creature you can see attacks a target other than you that is within five feet of you, you can use your reaction to impose disadvantage on the attack roll. You must be wielding a shield. This is your standard sword and board uh, technique. Uh, this is, you know, uh, you are fighting. This does best if you have uh, a couple fighters in the party or, or a couple melee users. You can walk up and you can have a more dangerous person or you can stick close to the mage or something like that. 
Um, you can, you know, you aren't doing a ton of damage because you're, you're there to absorb hits. Um, but your buddy is doing a ton of damage. And so the bad guys start focusing on him. You just slide over to him. Someone really bad comes over. You go, ah, disadvantage. And now they're going to have a significantly harder time attacking your buddy. Really, really effective if you're fighting um, enemy rogues. Um, there are quite a few monsters in the monster manual uh, and in um, the... Uh, uh, I can't remember what the other one, Volo's Guide, uh, that actually have the backstab ability. Uh, it's, it's a rogue thing, um, but there are, there are quite a few monsters that you can throw at, your, uh, at um, uh, enemies that have the backstab ability. Uh, a unique feature of the backstab ability is it only works um, if you don't have disadvantage. If you have disadvantage in the roll, it doesn't matter if you have allies near them or anything, uh, you lose the backstab. So protection is really good for being able to mess with really powerful melee users um, or uh, just, you know, again, it's designed to be that very protective fighter. Uh, and then the final one is two-weapon fighting. When you engage in two-weapon fighting, you can add your ability modifier to the damage of the second attack. That is, uh, again, that is a pure damage dealing thing. It's very, very useful uh, if you're going to be using two weapons. And again, being a fighter... Uh, you get a lot of attacks. With two-weapon fighting, you're going to get another attack. Um, and everything that a fighter does is really based around their attacks. Um, so by just increasing a little bit uh, and adding that additional attack, you can do a lot of things. Uh, again, especially when you start mixing it with some of the other things that are built into the class itself. Um, so the other thing that you get... Uh, right at level one, that's kind of a defining feature of the fighter, so it's called Second Wind. Um, basically, you can use a bonus action on your turn to regain hit points uh, equal to 1d10 plus your fighter level. Um, you can only do it uh, once per short or long rest, um, but this is a clutch thing for fighters. Um, in the middle of a battle, your healer is taking care of the other people, you know, you're up on your own. Uh, you're taking a lot of hits. Uh, to be able to sacrifice just a bonus action so that you can um, regain uh, hit points is great. And even at level 1, a D10, uh, that's your hit die. You could go to maximum hit points um, off of this. And going for, uh, you know, as you get to higher and higher levels, it's a significant chunk. You know, at level 10, you can get up to 20 hit points just for a bonus action. No spell slot, no nothing. You just get 20 hit points for free and then can still do all your crazy attacks. Um, so again, fighters are designed to make a lot of attacks and be kind of self-sufficient. Uh, and, 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 and that's what Second Wind really does. So those are the first level abilities of the fighter. Uh, and again, they lend themselves a lot more once you start looking at everything else that uh, the fighter gets. Um, at second level they get the other defining aspect of the fighter, which is Action Surge. Um, action Surge is actually something that is a holdover from 4th edition. In 4th edition, uh, all characters got these things called action points. What it was is you could burn an action point and you would get a major action, um, an additional major action that turn. Um, and it was really cool because uh, you could, you know, in a, in a clutch point, you could burn an action point and do something really amazing because you get two actions instead of just one that turn. Um, and with the abilities and everything built, built into 4th edition, um, it turned into some cool things. So they decided that it fit really well with what the fighter was designed to do, which is make a lot of attacks. Um, and so what the action surge does... Um, uh, da, da, da. Uh, it basically gives you another action. Uh, you just activate it, you get an additional action, which, because fighters get extra attack, that means if you're an 11th level fighter, every time you use the attack action, you attack three times. When you action surge as an 11th level fighter, you 
can take the attack action and make an additional three attacks. So three attacks have turned into six attacks. And if you combine that with, you know, something like a frost brand weapon, which does additional damage every time it hits, uh, or hex or hunter's mark, something like that, that is a ton of extra damage. Um, and it really, really changes how the game uh, is played and how the fighter is played once you start doing action surges. Uh, they allow for great burst damage. And with the, um, with the martial archetypes, which are the subclasses for the fighter, they can really, really change uh, just about everything uh, in uh, how the fighter works and everything. Um, so uh, the next thing you get at third level, you choose a martial archetype. Um, I will talk about those in a little bit because the rest of, of the fighters is, is kind of basic. Um, uh, again, it, it seems really, really simple when it's actually much more complex. Um, but talking about it's not going to take that much. Um, at fourth level, just like every other class, you get an ability score improvement. You can improve... Uh, one uh, ability score by two or two ability scores by one. Um, or you can forego that and take a feat. Uh, feats in 5th edition are massive changes to how your character plays. Um, they can be um, uh, even the relatively simple ones like dual wielder. Um, what that does is it allows you to dual wield weapons that don't have the light property. So that means instead of using two short swords, you can use two long swords. Um, so going from a D6 to a D8 uh, weapon die. It also gives you an additional point uh, 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 in your armor class as long as you have two weapons out. So uh, it's kind of like having the def uh, defense fighting style uh, built into... Uh, this feat, and then it lets you stow two weapons or draw or stow two weapons instead of just one. Um, so again, it, it lets you do more things. That is a fairly simple one. When you start talking about things like Sentinel, uh, that allows you to get extra opportunity attacks and things like that, and makes disengaging not work and actually stops people when you hit them with an opportunity attack. Um, it becomes very, very interesting. Um, especially since uh, a normal character in 5th edition will generally get 1, 2, 3, 4, will generally get 5 ability score improvements. And in general, you're not going to want to take 5 feats. Uh, you want to spend at least a few of those improving uh, your main stat. Um, and if you're someone like a monk, where you have like two main stats, you have wisdom and dexterity, you're going to spend quite a few of those ability score improvements getting your wisdom and dexterity up because they affect your armor class, they affect your attack power, everything. Um, uh, a fighter, on the other hand, gets one, two, three, four, five, six... Seven. A fighter gets seven ability score improvements. Um, so it's an additional two feats you could take. Or an additional uh, four points that you can put into any uh, ability score you want. You want a ton of hit points uh, and want to be really, really hard to poison and stuff like that? Max out your constitution. Um, you want to be, uh, you know... Um, Really, really difficult to mind control. Max out your wisdom. Uh, and like I said, with the fact that you can max out with, with a fighter generally, um, you're either going to be a strength or dexterity-based fighter, and you really technically don't need uh, another stat um, unless you take uh, the Eldritch Knight martial archetype, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so you can max out your strength. Let's say you're a strength-based fighter. You know, your standard sword and board. You're strength-based. Uh, you use a shield. You wear heavy armor. So your dexterity doesn't matter. So it, it doesn't matter what your dex score is. Um, constitution is relatively important to you because it gives you more hit points. But you can max out. Like, you can start level 1 with 16 strength. And two ability score improvements later, you can have maximum strength at 20 strength. Meaning every time you hit with your sword, you're doing, uh, bare minimum, you're doing five damage just from your ability modifier. 
Um, so again, when you're up to 20th level and you're hitting four times, that's 20 damage a turn that you get just for hitting. And then if you action surge on top of that, that's 40 damage in a single turn just from having maximum strength. So you do that in two ability score improvements. That gives you five feats that you could play around with. And those can be anything from something like Magic Initiate. Like I mentioned Hunter's Mark in there, uh, in here a lot. Um, that's a magic spell. Uh, you're not going to have access uh, to that because it's a hunter. Uh, it's a hunter only spell that uh, one specific kind of paladin gets access to it. But that's it. Um, so if you were to use one of your feats to get the Magic Initiate feat, you could take Hunter's Mark as one of your spells. And uh, um, that would uh, give you the ability during a tough fight. Um, you're only able to cast it once a day, but during a tough fight, you could Hunter's Mark the bad guy um, or anything. The, the Hunter's Mark lasts for an hour. Um, Hunter's Mark someone, and then you're just doing crap tons of damage because you took this magic initiate feat. Um, uh, I will do uh, uh, one of these in-depth guides on uh, the feats that are in the player's handbook um, and maybe one on Xanathar's guide too if you guys really like it uh, later. Um, but I am going to reference a few feats as I talk about uh, stuff like this, um, specifically with the fighter because, again, that's the fighter is designed to be able to take a lot of different feats. Um, one of the really unique and useful things I've seen is you'll have – a fighter using um, like a glaive or uh, a spear, you know, a weapon with reach. And they will take the sentinel feat, um, which lets them, anytime someone enters their attack range, they can make an opportunity attack. Um, with reach, that means that their attack range is 10 feet all around them. So if anyone gets within 10 feet of them, they can poke them. Well, the other thing with Sentinel is if you hit with an opportunity attack, it instantly ends the bad guy's movement. So if you have a bad guy running up to you that's going to try to hit you with really bad melee attacks or something like that, you hit them with uh, an attack as soon as they come into your range, uh, and then they can't get close enough to attack you back, and they've just wasted their turn. Um so, uh, you know, all those different feats and things like that. That's what the, the fighter is designed to do. Just be this massively customizable uh, character that you can turn into anything that you want. Uh, as long as it uses a weapon somehow. You can even imitate a couple other subclasses using the fighter and a few magic items. Um, so, uh, so, yeah. We talked about ability scores. Uh, extra attack, you get at 5th level. Uh, at 11, uh, So at 5th level, you attack twice every attack action. At 11th level, you attack three times every attack action. Uh, 20th level, you attack four times every attack action. And a lot of people think that for a 20th level ability, just adding an additional attack is really underwhelming. I've seen a lot of people that will multi-class a fighter uh, uh, at uh, uh, 18 or 19. Um, and just take a dip into another class. They're like, well, there's there's no point in me getting this because, you know, I, I, I could, you know, all it is is one extra attack. It isn't. Um, at 17th level for action surge, you get two action surges instead of one. So what looks like one extra attack, when you start adding action surges into it, turns into three extra attacks. And then combine that with, again, if you took the Magic Initiate feat and you have Hunter's Mark on there, that's an additional D6 of damage every single turn. Um, if you took the Dueling feat, that's an additional two damage every single turn. Again, a lot of people focus just on the, well, it's just one more attack, and they forget about everything else that the fighter is built on uh, and the fighter is designed to do. Every single attack that a fighter does uh, allows it to do things. And if you get uh, interesting feats, you know, a feat that a lot of people don't think about uh, is the Mage Slayer feat. Uh, the, the feat itself doesn't uh, seem to make a whole lot of sense. Um, 
especially for low levels, because uh, what it does is it lets you um, you have advantage on saving throws uh, when uh, you're right next to a spellcaster casting a spell at you. And then if you hit the spellcaster, they have disadvantage on their concentration check for any concentration spells. Concentration spells are all over 5th edition. And the worst spells to be cast on your party are concentration. Uh, dominate creature, dominate uh, or dominate beast, I can't remember what it is, uh, is a concentration spell that can take away uh, you know, your strongest character and turn them into a bad guy. Uh, hold person is a concentration spell. Um, banish is a concentration spell. You know, there are so many concentration spells, and as you, 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 you get higher in levels, um, you will fight a lot more magic users. So, again, fighters have all these extra feats that they can take. Taking Mage Slayer and turning your fighter into the ultimate, I'm going to kick the crap out of a mage, uh, is a, a very interesting and very fun way to play a character. Um, and uh, it's a really interesting uh, character uh, to play. Um, uh, from a mechanical standpoint, it changes things drastically for the dungeon master, for the rest of the party. Whenever a spellcaster shows up, you're going to be uh, running up to them specifically because you can deal with them better than anybody else. Um, so things like that really, really define the fighter. Um, uh, the final uh, thing that the fighter gets is this thing called Indomitable. You get it first at ninth level, um, and it basically uh, it means that if you fail a saving throw, you can reroll the saving throw. Um, at ninth level, you can do it once. Uh, at thirteenth level, you can do it twice. At seventeenth level, you can do it three times um, between long rests. Uh, again, this is another thing that's designed to make the fighter really, really resilient. Um, somebody throws something really bad at you, like a mind control uh, or uh, a hold person or something like that, and you just get a bad roll, indomitable, re-roll it. It works really, really well and uh, ensures that uh, you are doing exactly what it is you want to be doing, which is being the fighter, going out and just hitting things over and over and over again. Um, fighters also are the ones that get the, the most use out of magic, uh, weapons. Um, like I said, a frost brand sword, uh, does additional damage every hit. Um, something like that is incredibly useful for a fighter, uh, in ways that other classes can't really use it. Um, because of how many attacks a fighter gets. Um, and there are quite a few other weapons that, that have on hit effects and things like that. Those are perfect for fighters themselves because, again, they get so many attacks. They're really designed to uh, work with anything that adds additional damage. Um, there are even uh, uh, spells and things like that that um, I know paladins get it. Uh, where they can add additional damage uh, to weapons and stuff like that, or or even just getting plus one, plus two, plus three uh, standard magic weapons makes a huge difference because those add to attack and damage rolls. A plus two longsword is adding, you know, at level 11, is adding an additional six damage every turn uh, if you hit with all of your attacks, which, again, with the additional... Um, to hit chance, you're going to be happening a lot, lot more. The other thing that a lot of people don't think about is because fighters are rolling so often, they have significantly more chances to roll crits. Um, and there's uh, an archetype that actually makes that even more likely, and I'll talk about that in a little bit here. Um, but uh, because they're rolling so much, uh, they're going to be critting a lot more. They're going to be doing a lot more damage and doing a lot more cool things. So... Uh, that's kind of the fighter in a nutshell. Like I said, it seems really deceptively simple. Um, but when you take into account uh, just the fact that you can wear any kind of weapon, you can use any or you can use any kind of weapon, you can w w wear any kind of armor, you really have this very, very versatile class um, that can do crazy things. Um, now, because the fighter uh, itself... Uh, again, is is relatively simple. Oh, the other thing is, um, uh, 
at 17th level, you get Action Surge. You can use it twice instead of once. Um, and I'm trying to see uh, if there's anything else in there. Yeah, Action Surge and Indomitable. You just get more uses as you level up. So again, it seems relatively simple. It can be played relatively simply, uh, but there's so much more to the fighter from a mechanics standpoint. Um, so Martial Archetypes. These are the subclasses. Again, other than the Eldritch Knight, which can get very, very confusing um, if, uh, uh, if, you're, if you're not careful, um, the archetypes are generally pretty simple. Um, but again, it's deceptively so. Um, so I'm going to start with probably the most simple, the easiest for new players uh, archetype. Uh, it's called the Champion. The Champion is designed to just make it easier to do lots of damage. That's what the champion does. They do lots of damage. They're very simple to play. They don't have any really complicated mechanics. They, you don't have extra dice you have to worry about. Uh, you hit things, they die. That's what you do. Um, but it's still a really, really interesting class, despite the fact that it is a little bit more simple than the other two. Um, so the first thing you get at level three is you get what's called improved critical. It means that at third level, your weapon attacks score critical hit on a 19 or a 20. So uh, a crit, from a pure math standpoint, you have a 5% chance anytime you roll the dice of rolling a critical hit. Um, basic math, it's a 1 in 20 chance because there's 20 sides on the dice. Uh, 120 is equal to 5%. Um, 120th is equal to 5%. Um, hitting on a 19 or a 20 means that you have now improved your critical chance. You have doubled it. Uh, if you're that great weapon fighter, uh, fighter where you're using you know a great sword, that means on a 19 or 20, one out of every 10 times you roll the dice statistically, you're going to get a crit. So instead of rolling uh, 2d6 damage, you're going to roll 4d6 damage. And any 1s or 2s on any of those four dice, uh, you're going to be able to re-roll. Um, so that's a big deal. Uh, criticals uh, change how combat works. The fact that the champion can do it much easier uh, means that they're going to be doing tons of damage. Even a sword and board champion, where they're just using a long sword, they're not really built uh, to be able to um, do tons of damage. Uh, with the champion, they're going to be able to keep pace with the more damage-oriented classes like the barbarian or... Um, uh, or uh, even some of the uh, spellcasting classes. It's, it's going to be single target damage, but still pretty effective. Um, the second thing that uh, you get is at 7th level, you can add half your proficiency bonus, rounded up, to any strength, dexterity, or constitution check you make that doesn't already use your proficiency bonus. Um, and in addition, when you make a running long jump, the distance you can cover increases by a number of feet equal to your strength modifier. Uh, a lot of people don't use the jumping mechanics in 5th edition, so the second part, your mileage will vary. Uh, but that first part, it basically means anything that you're not, uh, anything that you're not trained in, uh, that strength or dexterity. So strength is going to be athletics. Um, athletics is used for a ton of things. Um, it's used for climbing, it's used for grappling checks, it's used to break out of grapples in combat, um, uh, it's used to open door, for, uh, force open locks, like it's, it's just tons and tons. So if for whatever reason your fighter isn't trained in that, you're going to still get a little bit of a bonus. Um, uh, Dexterity-based things are stealth, uh, sleight of hand, and acrobatics. Uh, now... If you are a strength-based fighter, you're probably not going to train in any of those. What this means um, is uh, you're, uh, you're going to be able to do them a little bit better than you were able to before. You're not going to fail anywhere near as often. So even in plate mail, you're going to be able to walk across that tightrope uh, that much easier. Um, at uh, at seventh level, you're only looking at like a plus two, 
but a plus two again, you know, D20, you're looking at a, you know, a 10% increase um, is uh, still nice. And then when you start getting up to the higher levels, uh, that's, uh, uh, is it rounded up or down? Round it up. Yeah, and you get to round up for it, so it's really, really nice. Um, uh, and then it can get up to a plus three, so very, very useful in certain situations. It's a role-playing um, focus. Um, at uh, tenth level, you get an additional fighting style. Remember I talked about fighting styles before, where you only got to choose one? The champion gets to choose another one. So you could take, um, you know... Great weapon fighting, and then add on defensive so that you're a little bit harder to hit while you're murdering people. Um, you could take, uh, uh, you could take uh, again, uh, protection and dueling so that you can sit there and protect your friends and impose disadvantage on bad guys, uh, but then also do extra damage with your sword while you're using your shield. Um, or you could take two weapon fighting and defensive and then combine that with uh the dual wielder feet and uh it effectively means that you have the equivalent of a shield anytime you're wielding two weapons because you'll have a plus one from your ac and a plus one from wielding two weapons because of dual wielder so normally a shield adds plus two so uh by combining that using the champion to get that additional fighting style um yeah, you can, again, really customize the character, really change how they play, and really make sure that it plays the exact way that you want it to. Um, at 15th level, your weapon attacks score critical hit on rolls of 18 to 20. Now we've added an additional 5% chance for crits. And again, fighters get more attacks at 15th level you're attacking three times if you're action surging you're attacking six times um you uh have a 15 percent chance now every single time you attack to get a critical hit uh which again uh if you have a frost band uh weapon because it does a, a die instead of a flat damage you're going to be doubling that uh if there's a anything else if you have hunter's mark because you took uh, magic initiate feat um you're going to be uh rolling 2d6 instead of 1d6 uh if you crit you know it just explodes basically uh when uh you start dealing with the fact that you now are critting um 15 percent uh of the time uh so very very useful there and then uh the final thing you get at 18th level is um at the start of each of your turns, you regain hit points equal to 5 plus your constitution modifier. If you have no more than half your hit points left, you don't gain this benefit if you have zero hit points. Basically means if you get under half your hit points, you get regeneration, um, which is massively useful. Again, the, uh, the champion seems really, really basic, and it kind of is um, until you start factoring in uh, the additional criticals and how they affect everything else that you do you are built to make a lot of attacks uh and then you add in survivor you're built to take a lot of attacks and then you just start uh regaining hit points again um if uh if you have a 20 constitution uh which is very possible since uh again you're uh you're a uh a, a fighter you get seven ability sp score increases you could max out both your strength and your constitution pretty easily uh, by just using four of the seven you have and still have three f free for feats. Um, that's ten hit points around that you just get. Combine that with your action surge uh, to give you even more, or not action surge, your second wind. Um, you're really hard to take down um, while you're doing extra crits and things like that. I mean, that's what it does. Um, uh, the next one uh, is a little bit more complicated, so I'm actually going to skip the Battle Master uh, right now, and I'm going to come back to it. Um, partially because it is my favorite uh, of the the three uh, martial archetypes, and I think it really um, kind of uh, it defines what a fifth edition fighter is. Uh, the Battle Master is is um, I think the best example of a fifth edition fighter. Um, so I'm going to skip over that uh, a little bit uh, to go to the Eldritch Knight. 
uh, not because it's uh, more complicated, but because, uh, or not because it's less complicated, uh, but because uh, it changes the fighter a lot more than the Battlemaster does. The Battlemaster really digs into what a 5th edition fighter is, whereas the Eldritch Knight um, modifies the fighter to do some different things. What the Eldritch Knight uh, subclass does, it turns it into what's called a half caster, um, which means instead of getting all the way up to ninth level spells, you'll only get up to fourth level spells, and you generally get less spell slots. Um, however, uh, this adds magic uh, to the fighter. So if you want to be that really cool, you know, magic wielding uh, uh, sword user that that's what an eldritch knight is designed for now it does have a few limitations to it um for spells uh known every uh every spell casting class uh has uh some things that they mention um they will mention spell slots and how they work uh which in fifth edition is you have spell slots and you have spells uh magic missile is a first level spell so uh, if you have two first level spots, uh, two second level slots, and one third level slot, you can cast Magic Missile using any one of those slots. And it will get more powerful depending on which slot you use. Um, certain spells get more powerful when you cast them at higher levels. Any spell can be cast at a higher level, even if it doesn't get more powerful. You just waste a higher level slot. Um, uh, however, something like Scorching Ray is a second level spell. If you have the same, again, two first level, two second level, one third level, you cannot cast Scorching Ray using a first level slot. Um, you can only use second or third level. That's basically how spell casting works. Um, so uh, it describes those. Um, you get all your spell slots back uh, after a long rest. Um, you are half wizard at this point. Uh, the thing that uh, makes things a little bit trickier with an Eldritch Knight is uh, the spells that you can learn. Um, now, you don't have to prepare spells like a wizard does. Um, you, uh, you just know them because they're, far, they're part of your fighting style. Um, uh, so uh, you don't have to... Uh, you basically have them all memorized. But the limitation you get along with the fact that you don't have to prepare spells every day uh, is the fact that um, uh, at uh, third level, when you choose this, you know three first level wizard spells of your choice, two of which you must choose from the abjur abjuration and evocation spells on the wizard spell list. So the Eldritch Knight is designed to use abjuration and uh, evocation spells. Uh, abjuration spells modify things. Uh, think of them kind of like buffs, uh, and you know they 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 change things. Um, uh, evocation spells are are your basic kind of damaging spells. Um, evocation are you know fireballs things like that. So it fits into the fighters. Uh, class in the idea that again the fighter is designed to do um damage so evocation spells and then the fighter is designed to be resilient so abjuration spells so they can defend themselves and they can do damaging magic attacks um so interesting uh uh but again limiting um as you level up um you have to choose evocation or abjuration spells as you learn more spells um, and by the time you hit level 20 you'll know 13 spells most of those will have to be evocation or abjuration so there are eight schools of magic you are limited generally to two the only difference is at third level one of your spells can be non uh, abjuration or evocation and then at 8th 14th and 20th level you can choose a spell that's not from those two spell schools. So maximum, you can have four spells that are not either defensive or offensive in nature. That can do something else. Um, so again, that's kind of the limiting factor. Um, one of these days, uh, I'm going to have to go through uh, the spell list and just kind of talk about spells and stuff like that. If I ever do a wizard one of these, 
that will be um, after I explain the wizard itself, uh, I will probably go through per level the spells and what they do and things like that uh, to really give people an idea of, of the useful spells and stuff like that. I tried doing that with the druid and the the episode got too long and I brushed over way too much. Um, so if you guys are interested in hearing me talk about magic in, in 5th edition and you know how to use spells effectively and stuff like that, say something in the comments. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically the, the big thing with the uh, Eldritch Knight is the fact that they can cast spells and that changes things. Uh, shield spell, massively useful. It's a first level spell and you use it uh, as a reaction. What it is, is if you get hit by something that uh, is higher than your armor class, you can cast the spells in a reaction and it increases your armor class by five. That is a major increase, and that increase lasts until the start of your next turn. So, it's a massively useful spell for Eldritch Knights to have, because they can run into the fray, people can try attacking them, they throw up uh, this shield spell, and then they are almost untouchable. You know, uh, if you already have a 20 AC because you're wearing, you know, full plates, plus you have a shield... Um, uh, and then you add on that you have a 25 armor class you have a higher armor class than anything in the game anything in the monster manual I think the highest I've ever seen is about a 24 armor class um, so that is incredible that makes you insanely difficult to hit and it's going to make people waste a lot of attacks trying to hit you um, so really really great uh, there's a bunch of other spells that I'm not going to get into um, but I do want to talk about the other things that the Eldritch Knight does. Um, so at third level, you also get what's called Weapon Bond. This is cool. Uh, and this is great for those parties that find themselves on the wrong side of the law often, uh, where you're getting arrested and things like that. What Weapon Bond is, is uh, third level, uh, you learn a ritual that creates a magical bond between yourself and one weapon. You perform the ritual over the course of an hour, which can be done during a short rest. The mess, uh, blah, 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 blah. Once you've bonded a weapon to yourself, you can't be disarmed of that weapon unless you are incapacitated. If it's on the same plane of existence, you can summon that weapon as a bonus action on your turn, causing it to teleport instantly to your hand. You can have up to two bonded weapons, but can summon only one at a time with your bonus action. If you attempt to bond with a third weapon, you must break the bond. You can teleport your weapon to you. It's super cool. Um, you get, uh, as long as it's on the same plane of existence, like, it doesn't even have to be in the same city. Your party gets captured. They disarm you. They take you to a different city to sell you into slavery. As soon as the guards aren't looking, you go, uh, shoop. I have my sword back. Chop, chop, chop. We're done. Uh, it's a really, really cool thing. The other thing that's, that's really cool is you can't be disarmed. Um, the Battlemaster has a disarmed thing. There are certain things that can disarm you and things like that. Uh, the fact that you cannot be disarmed... Uh, unwillingly, like you can put your weapon down, but you cannot be disarmed unless you're incapacitated, makes this fighter really, really interesting because they are, they have this bond with their sword. They, they, you know, you can't take their sword away from them. So in situations where you're being captured by the guards and stuff like that, like you can really have an interesting character. And then, like I said, as long as you're on the same plane of existence, you can just go boop. Oh, looks i have my sword again stab it's a really cool ability um if you combine it with like a throwing weapon or something like that it's a little bit limited because it takes your bonus action um but like if you use a spear spears can be thrown uh, and they're also versatile um so you can sit there use a spear uh with a shield or a spear on its own so you a spear with a shield you can throw the spear teleport it back uh, throw it again because you get all these additional attacks and then uh, just run up and, and uh, if you have another attack, stab him uh, or just, just wait it out. Uh, so from like 5th to 11th level, you can be a ranged fighter uh, where you just sit back and you huck your spear, 
call it back and huck it again using the uh, uh, using the weapon bond feature. Um, and that's something a lot of people don't think about. They think about the weapon bond like, oh, well, that's cool. Uh, they don't think of just how many different things you can do with that. Um, the next thing you learn, beginning at 7th level, when you use your action to cast a cantrip, you can make one weapon tack as a bonus action. Uh, very, very useful um, if you are using a two-handed weapon. Um, cast uh, a cantrip spell. Um, one of the most useful uh, showed up in the Sword Coast Adventures Guide. Uh, it's called Green Flame Blade uh, or Booming Blade is another one that's really, really useful. What it is is it's a cantrip where you make an attack... Um, it scales as you get more powerful, so it does extra damage as you, as you get more powerful. And then with War Magic, you can also just get an extra attack with a really big weapon at the same time. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it, it just, again, it gives you the ability to do more damage and to be able to do interesting things. Things like with Booming Blade, when you hit them, you do additional thunder damage, and then if they move from that spot... Uh, after they get hit with it, they will take damage on their turn. So you can hit them with Booming Blade, run away because you have a crazy high AC, or maybe you took the move... Uh, uh, I think it's the movement feat, if I remember correctly, where basically any time you make an attack against someone, they can't make opportunity attacks against you. Um, you hit him with Booming Blade, you get an additional attack as a bonus action, you run away, and then when he tries to chase you, he gets hit even more. Uh, and crazy, crazy awesome damage. Uh, so that's really useful. Um, at 10th level, you get Eldritch Strike. Um, you learn how to make your weapon strikes undercut a creature's resistance to your spells. When you hit a creature with a weapon attack, that creature has disadvantage in the next saving throw it makes against a spell you cast before the end of your next turn. This is, again, specifically designed to um, uh, combine swordplay and magic. A really effective way to do this, again, you get all these additional feats. If you take uh, the... Uh, I can't remember what the feat's called. I'm going to actually look it up really quickly so I'm not referencing the wrong feat over and over and over again. Uh, mobile. It's called Mobile. One of the aspects of that feat is any time it increases your speed, uh, but any time you attack someone, they can't take reactions against you. They can't take opportunity attacks specifically. Um, so if you take the mobile feat with the Eldritch Knight, um, what you can do is... I totally just lost the page I was on for Fighter. That's Wizard. That's Rogue. Going back through the alphabet... There's Paladin. There we go. Um, so, uh, yeah, what you can do is you run up, uh, hit two or three people, depending on how many attacks you have, burn an action surge if you really want to, uh, hit uh, a bunch of people with attacks. They now all have disadvantage. Then you step back and cast Fireball or cast Lightning Bolt or something like that on your next turn, or to really mess with people because you have that action surge, you go in, hit a bunch of people with your weapon so they have disadvantage. You step back, action surge, and then cast Fireball or something that requires a save. All of them fail because they now all have disadvantage on the save. Um, and see, that's where a lot of people kind of think, well one extra attack, what exactly is that going to do? That is an additional, for this archetype, that is an additional person that you can give disadvantage to against uh, your next super powerful spell that you're going to cast at them and decimate them. Um, this is something that no one but fighters can do, imposing disadvantage on saving throws just by hitting people with their weapon, which is what they're designed to do. Um, so very, very, very effective. Um... Uh, at 15th level, you get what's called Arcane Charge. Uh, whenever you use your Action Surge, uh, you can teleport up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space, you can see. Um, and you can teleport before or after the action. This is, that really lends into that idea of you just run into a big group of bad guys, you hit three or four of them, uh, and then you action surge, you teleport out and go, goodbye, boys, and cast Fireball and decimate them. 
Um, you know, uh, again, all of these things feed into the fact that you get these multiple attacks. Um, or, uh, again, you could use it just, just straight up attacks. You could sit there, go in, just make a bunch uh, of attacks, action surge, teleport to another part uh, of uh, uh, the group, do more attacks, run away because you have the mobile feet, uh, and then your next turn, cast fireball and kill even more people. You know, again, all these things stack upon each other and they all hinge on these extra attacks that you get as a fighter. And a lot of people just kind of discredit uh, the attacks as, oh, well, it's only, you know, an additional 12 damage or 15 damage or something like that. It makes a world of difference because of all these other things. Uh, and then... Uh, Uh, at uh, um, 18th, you get what's called Improved War Magic. Uh, you can use your uh, whenever you use your action to cast a spell, you get uh, you can make one weapon attack as a bonus action. So before it was just cantrips, now it's any spell, and there are some seriously powerful spells that you can get. Despite the fact that you only get up to fourth level magic, um, there are some seriously powerful spells that you can cast. And then go in and smack with a uh, with a weapon attack. Um, so uh, yeah, and because again, evocation spells are all the damaging spells. Um, you can do some pretty serious stuff uh, with that. Um, so that's the Elder tonight. Now I want to talk about the Battle Master because again, uh, and I know this video is running a little bit long, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I I think it's totally worth it. So again, the Battlemaster, I believe, encapsulates what a 5th edition fighter is. Um, it is built on the idea that every attack you make with your weapon counts and can change the outcome of battle significantly. Uh, the Battlemaster is one of the few control-type classes, uh, uh, subclasses in the game. You know how I mentioned uh, action economy and, and kind of controlling the battlefield is one of the things that monks do really, really well? Um, Battlemaster fighters uh, do it in a very different way, um, but are still uh, very, very effective at uh, controlling the battlefield, giving their allies the advantage and things like that. Um, so um, the thing that defines the Battlemaster fighter uh, is third level, you get this thing called Compact superiority um you uh when you choose it at third level you learn maneuvers that are fueled by special dice called superiority dice um you learn three maneuvers when you first take this class and you learn additional ones as you get higher and higher your superiority dice um are d8s and um you get them all back when you uh, finish a short or a long rest um you start with four of them, and then at seventh level, you get a fifth one, and at 15th level, you get a sixth one. And uh, some of them require, uh, some of the uh, things you do require saving throws. The saving throw is based on either your strength or your dex. So the ability that you're already really good with, uh, and you've already probably, uh, you're probably planning on maxing out anyways, that's what your saving throw is based on. So you will have super, super high saving throws against these, and they do amazing, awesome things. It's one of the reasons Battlemaster is my favorite fighter archetype in the Player's Handbook. Um, uh, the other thing you get at third level, you gain proficiency with one type of artisan's tool of your choice. Now, uh, I will go over the maneuvers at the end here because they're listed at the end of the description. Uh, but... Uh, uh, Regardless, uh, the way that they work is you add them. When you make an attack, you add a maneuver to that attack. So again, based on the idea that fighters get more attacks, um, the battle master encapsulates that because every attack has the chance of using a superiority dice to change the battlefield, to change how things are working. And it makes huge, huge differences to... Uh, every everything that's happening on the battlefield um so uh when you get to seventh level you get what's called know your enemy um if you spend at least one minute observing or interacting with another creature outside of combat 
You can learn certain information about its capabilities compared to your own. Uh, the DM tells you uh, if this creature is your equal, superior, or inferior in regard of two uh, of the following characteristics of your choice. Strength score, dex score, con score, armor class, current hit points, total class levels, fighter class levels. Uh, this is uh, a prep work. This is... Uh, uh, this is a no, uh, again, it's called know your enemy. Uh, this is something that's going to give you an edge in battle because you, um, if you have the time to observe the bad guy before you fight him, uh, because again, it only takes a minute, uh, which is really not that long. Um, you can know, okay, I'm going to observe this guy for a minute. What do I, I find? I want to, you know, I want to know about his AC or, you know, I want to know about his hit points. You can find the guys that are going to drop first because they have the lowest hit points you can find the guys that are going to be um easiest uh to hit because they have the lowest armor class a lot of different things uh because you can uh find out their strength or dexterity score especially if you have um uh like a middle of the ground dexterity score because you didn't put a lot into it uh that can really tell you okay those are the ones that you should be fireballing because they're going to be failing the most uh, again, this is something that will give you a lot of control on the battlefield because you're getting information that no other class can get. Um, at uh, 10th level, you get improved combat superiority. What that means is those D8 combat superiority dice, which I'll explain why this is uh, important when I go through the uh, maneuvers, uh, they turned into D10s. And then at 18th level, they turned into D12s. Uh, that's a really big deal because a lot of the times they either turn into extra damage um, or uh, they help your allies with giving them extra damage or extra AC or, or a lot of different things. So the fact that they can get up to a D12 is major. Um, and then uh, at 15th level, when you roll initiative and have no superiority dice remaining, you regain one superiority dice. So if you're... If you blow all your superiority dice in a fight and then you get another one unexpectedly, you get a free one. Uh, which, again, when I explain the maneuvers and everything, you will understand that is really, really important. Uh, that means you're going to, again, be able to control the battlefield, help, 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 help out your party even more than you could before. So, maneuvers. These are what influence the battle. These are what change how things work um they're really really useful every one of them requires you or almost every one of them requires you to make an attack so the more attacks you have the more chances you get for superiority dice and a lot of them uh you can add on uh afterwards after the attack hits so you're never wasting superiority dices uh dice on missed attacks um, that makes this a very, very powerful class. Uh, so we'll start with, uh, we'll just start at the top and we'll go through them. Uh, Commander's Strike. Uh, when you take the attack action on your turn, you can forego one of your attacks and use a bonus action to direct one of your companions to strike. When you do so, choose a friendly creature who can see or hear you and expend one superiority dice. The creature can immediately use its reaction to make one weapon attack, adding the superiority die to the attack's damage roll. So this is the, uh, uh, there was a class in 4th edition called the Warlord. And one of the things they could do is instead of them making an attack, they could have someone else make an attack. This is massively useful. Because it uses your bonus action, you can only do this once per turn. Despite the fact that you get multiple attacks, you only do this once per turn. But this can be game changing. Something like a rogue. Uh, sneak attack is interesting in the fact that it says uh, you can only use sneak attack once per turn, not per round. So if you have a rogue in the party and you have a battle master, they can use commander's strike to let the rogue make another attack. And if they hit with that attack, they get their sneak attack damage again. Plus they get an additional, you know, superiority dice, uh, which is anywhere from a D8 to a D12. And if they crit on it, um, then they're going to be not only doubling their sneak attack damage, they're going to be doubling your superiority dice. Um, if you have a champion fighter with you where they get those expanded criticals, 
burning a commander's strike is a great way to you lose only one attack plus your bonus action. You still have two more attacks uh, depending on your level. At level 5, you still have one more attack you get to make. At level 11, you have two more attacks you can make. At level 20, you have three more attacks you can make after using this commander's strike. Um, but you can let them burn a reaction and possibly get a crit plus extra damage. Um, so it's really, really useful. Um, another one that's really useful is either uh, Warlocks, um, or not Warlocks, um, Hunters with Hunter's Mark uh, can do crazy damage. Um, stuff like that. Um, so Commander's Strike means you get to choose who gets to do extra damage. Very, very useful. Disarming Attack. Um, when you hit a creature with a weapon attack, that's how most of these start, which means you never waste the superiority die on a missed attack. Uh, you choose to do this after you hit, and you know you hit. You can spend one superiority dice to attempt to disarm the target, forcing it to drop one item of your choice that it's holding. You add the superiority die to the attack's damage roll, and the target must make a strength saving throw. On a failed save, it drops the object you choose. The object lands at its feet. Disarming your opponent, massively useful. If you've got a bad guy who has a shield, use disarming attack on him, take the shield out, that's uh, a minimum of a 2 AC drop. Um, if one of your allies picks up the shield, that bad guy can, can't get that shield back unless he can somehow disarm one of your allies. Um, if the bad guy is using a really wicked magic weapon that's doing tons of damage, disarm him. You, uh, you can take his weapon, a friend can take his weapon. Um, depending on how you interpret the rules, picking a weapon, it, generally in, in my book, picking a weapon up off the ground is considered an action as opposed to interacting with an object just because it, it makes disarming attack more useful. Um, because bare minimum, that means when you, uh, when they drop the item, uh, unless they want to just punch you, they have to waste their action picking up their sword, even if nobody else touches it. Um, so again, that changes the action economy. That does a lot and you get, uh, you know, additional damage on top of it. So if you crit, that's another thing that Battlemaster fighters are great with. When you crit, you will always toss on, uh, one of these maneuvers because instead of doing one superiority die you're going to do two um because you double every you roll double the amount of dice you normally would um so that's good uh distracting strike um uh the next attack uh roll against the target by an attacker other than you has advantage if the attack is made before the start of your next turn uh, this is, again, this is a way to give it, uh, uh, advantage, um, to, um, things. The nice thing about this is all of these are with a weapon attack. If you are a shooty, shooty, um, uh, fighter, you can still use these because it doesn't say melee attack. It says weapon attack. So you're using a longboard, uh, a longbow. You can be a hundred feet away, shoot them use distracting strike on them and then your rogue who normally would need an ally next to him can just run up because he has his advantage he gets uh sneak attack damage hit the guy bonus action to get out of there and do crazy awesome stuff or he can stay there and you can um uh you can uh commanding strike to uh uh, get him another attack or something like that. Like there's, there are tons of different things that you can do with that. Um, evasive fo footwork. When you move, you can expend one superiority dice, rolling the die and adding the number rolled to your AC until you stop moving. This is, uh, this is a move designed to, uh, take out opportunity attacks. Um, if you can roll, uh, if you can add eight to your AC or 12 to your AC, um, they're not going to hit you. Um, so what you do is uh, you burn one superiority die, you run around uh, and uh, use up the reactions of all the bad guys as they try and attack you. Um, and uh, then uh, 
they waste all of their reactions. They no longer have reactions to do things like cast Counterspell, or they don't have reactions to make opportunity attacks against your other allies who can't take an opportunity attack. Um, so very defensive, again, action economy based. Uh, fainting attack. Um, Uh, feigning attack, you use your bonus action to basically give yourself advantage against uh, somebody uh, within five feet of you. Um, and if you hit, you add the superior uh, uh, superiority dice to the damage. Um, so that's something that, you know, you have a really tough guy that you're trying to hit. Use a feigning attack, you get advantage, hit him hard, and then get extra damage on top of it. Again, it uses your bonus action, so you can only do it once per round, despite the fact that you have multiple attacks. Um, but you can combine that with a disarming strike or you can combine that with a distracting strike or something like that and, and, and do all these other things. Um, goading attack. Uh, they have to make a wisdom save. Um, and then any attack they make against someone other than you is made with disadvantage. Again, combine that with the mobility feat. And uh, or the mobile feet, and you have a really effective way of taking a really powerful attacker and making them useless. Um, you run up, you goading strike them, do a couple more attacks with whatever else you want, and then you run away. Um, and they can't uh, they can't get to you, and so if they try to attack somebody else. Um, they're going to have disadvantage. It basically forces them to attack you over anyone else, and you're designed to be attacked. So, again, another way to play with the action economy, another way to protect your allies uh, and really mess with the bad guys. Um, lunging attack. Um, if you make a melee weapon attack on your turn, you can expend one superiority dice to increase your reach for that attack by five feet. So, basically... Uh, this is something where if you don't want, uh, you know, to get close, uh, this is, uh, especially true, um, with, uh, things that have auras where if you're within five feet and you hit them, you get, uh, you get damage or something like that, use a lunging attack, uh, and they won't be able to, uh, do anything about it because you're additional five feet away. And if you have a reach weapon, um, that, uh, you just add five feet onto what your normal, range with that so that means you can hit from 15 feet away with a lunging attack and add extra damage to it uh so again uh another thing that just makes you a very very useful uh thing when you combine that with sentinel you can go 15 feet away poke him uh he comes uh within 10 feet of you you opportunity attack him stop him in his tracks and then rinse and repeat and he just you kite him around uh the battlefield because every time he tries to move you stop him again um Maneuvering attack. <coughs> um, so what that uh, maneuvering attack is, it does extra damage. Um, and then uh, you can choose one of your allies. They can move up to half their speed without provoking an opportunity attack from the guy that uh, you hit. Uh, this is, I call it the maid saver. Um, Bad guy comes up to your wizard and hits him hard. The wizard needs to get away, but is not going to survive an opportunity attack. And the guy's just waiting. You walk over really calmly. You smack him with a maneuvering attack or maneuvering. Yeah. Maneuvering attack. You tell the wizard to get out of there and the wizard gets away scot-free while he's forced to deal with you. And then you can do a goading attack on your next attack uh, and then he really is forced to, to do that. Or you can do a disarming attack and take away his weapon or anything like that. Um, menacing attack. Um, uh, this basically uh, adds the frighten condition to a creature. This is really, really effective if, uh, 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 again, uh, you want to just really mess with a guy that's, that's focusing on you. Frighten means they can't willingly move towards you. Um, which also means uh, if you're standing in front of or near uh, someone that they want to attack, if you frighten them, they can't walk near him either. And it also means that they have disadvantage on attack rolls against you. 
So again, another thing that's going to change the action economy, it's going to change their ability to do things. Uh, Perry, uh, when another creature damages you with a melee attack, you can use your reaction to expend one of your superiority dice to reduce the damage by the number you roll on your superiority dice plus your dex modifier. This is a way to just stop people from hurting you. It is a dexterity-based thing. Um, so it's best used if you're, if you're using, um, you know, if you're a dex based fighter, uh, it's not going to do a whole lot for the strength ones, but again, uh, dex based, you're generally going to have a lower AC when they hit you, you can just go meh and, uh, parry it and get rid of most of the damage. Uh, you know, a D10 plus that, you know, uh, a D10 or a D12, that means you can get rid of up to 17 damage with that. Um, precision attack. Uh, it basically means you can add your superiority die to the attack roll. Um, and you can use uh, the maneuver before or after making the roll, but you have to use it before you find out if it hit or not, uh, which is a common thing in, you hear that phrase in 5th edition all the time. Basically, this just means that uh, you really, really need to hit this guy. You, you, you've got to hit this guy. You just It's going to happen. And you roll a two. Crap. Well, even with my really good, you know, it's only a 12 and he has, you know, an 18 armor class. Precision attack. Roll that. Add another eight to it. You've now hit when you should have missed. Um, really, really good uh, for that. Pushing attack is exactly what it sounds like. Um, uh, if it's large or smaller, it makes a strength save. On a failed save, you can push the target up to 15 feet away from you. Again, this is great for maneuvering people into fireball formation. Uh, if you have a clever dungeon master who has pitfalls and things like that built into uh, your encounters, uh, use it to push a guy off a cliff. I lost a character because a yeti uh, paralyzed me, grappled me, took me to the edge of the cliff, and dropped me. Um, and my character died outright because it was a 200 foot fall. Uh, it was the first time I'd ever had a character die and they did resurrect me, which was nice. But, um, yeah, uh, re, you know, push them away, change where they are, you know, do these other things. If you hit with the first attack, uh, attack and disarm him. And then the second attack, you use a pushing attack. Now the weapon is no longer at his feet. The weapon is 15 feet away. Um, and if you get in between him and his weapon, he can't do anything. Uh, he can't get to his weapon. You've effectively, uh, made it so that he can't do what it is that he's designed to do. Um, rally, this one's super, super useful. Uh, on your turn, you can use a bonus action, expend one superior die to bolster resolve of one of your companions. When you do so, choose a friendly creature who can see and hear you. That creature gains temporary hit points equal to the superiority die roll. Plus your charisma. You get a heal. Battle masters can heal. Um, they're temporary hit points, so they do go away eventually. Uh, but they can be clutch. Um, if you've got someone that is like on the brink of death, uh, you know, burn your bonus action, rally them, give them some temporary hit points so that they can get out of there. Another thing that a lot of people don't realize, um, temporary hit points can bring someone out of unconsciousness. Um, as, uh, as soon as the temporary hit points go away, if they don't have any more hit points, they'll go unconscious again. But if someone is, you know, they're two deaths, uh, two failed death saves already, and there's a chance that they're going to die, rally them, give them temporary hit points. It makes them conscious again, which, uh, gets rid of, uh, all of their failed saves. And then it gives somebody else time, or even they can just chug a potion so that they don't go unconscious again. Um, so very, very useful. Repost, uh, if you get missed, you can use a reaction and expend a superiority die to uh, hit him. Uh, and you add the damage roll. So this is just, you missed me, I'm going to bop you back. Uh, so extra damage, really, really useful. Uh, and again, if you combine that with other things like Frostbrand and stuff like that, again, that's just crazy amounts of damage. Again, fighters are designed, use your attacks. Every attack is important. Every attack can change uh, the battle, especially with the battle master. Uh, sweeping attack. When you hit a creature with a melee weapon attack, you could expend a superiority dance 
to damage uh, die to damage another creature with the same attack. Choose another creature within five feet of the original target and within reach. If the original attack roll would hit the second creature, it takes damage equal to the number you rolled on your superiority die. Um, so this basically means you hit somebody and then you can do some extra damage to another guy. Um, again, this is uh, something that's that's great for hordes of small creatures, things like that, that, that dungeon masters will throw at you to just really screw with your rogue. Uh, because he can sneak attack them for, you know, 400 damage, but they only have seven hit points, so it's a waste of a sneak attack. Uh, that's where this really shines, when you're fighting a lot of bad guys and you're just kind of mowing through them. It's a great way to do that. And if you do, you know, three or four of those, uh, they're taking a significant amount of damage. Uh, and then trip attack. Uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. You hit them, you knock them prone. Um, they have a save, I think it's a strength save, yeah. Uh, strength save, uh, but once they're prone, there's a lot of things that that does. First things first, they have disadvantage on any attack rolls they make while they're prone. Um, and any melee attacks made against them uh, have advantage. Um, so that changes things drastically, making it much easier uh, to hit them. Um, if... Uh, um, you know, to give you uh, an interesting scenario where you would use a bunch of these superiority dice, you start off by disarming the guy, boom, drops his sword. Then you use a push attack, boom, you knock him back 15 feet. Then you use a trip attack, boom, he's now prone. You've used three attacks, which generally, uh, until you hit level 20, that's all your attacks for that turn. Um, but you've now taken his weapon away, you've made it so that he can't get to it, and you've also knocked him over, which to stand up takes half your movement. So there's really no chance he's going to be able to get back to his weapon. Uh, and then if you action surge, you can just get three free attacks with advantage. So um, that's the Battle Master. Again, this is a really long video, uh, but I wanted to get through everything um, in here because just doing the fighter by itself was going to be a very sh short video. Um, and uh, like I said, I really wanted to kind of focus on what a lot of people think is a really simple class. You know, I hit things, they die. Um, but when you really look at the class, when you look at uh, all the different feats and everything like that, um, that you can take and how they can change your attacks and how they can uh, uh, really, really uh, modify how the character works, um, you have a really, really complicated class um, that can be played very, very simply. You can, you can just go the champion fighter route um, and only worry about attacking every turn and, and have a very, very effective uh, character. Or you can use a bunch of feats and things like that to really uh, change how the character plays, turn them into a mage slayer, turn them into a... Uh, 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 get the sentinel feet and turn them into a, a massive defender. Uh, get the mo mo uh, mobility or the mobile feet uh, and turn them into, you know, this, this kind of whirling dervish of I run into combat and then I run back out. Um, you have a lot of different options with the fighter, with how many ability score improvements they get and how many feats they could possibly have, uh, especially if it's a human fighter and you take the bonus feet at first level. Um, that's eight uh, eight possible feats. Um, and at least a couple of those are going to go into either strength or dexterity because that's how the fighter is built. Um, but all the rest are going to change how you play the character. They're going to massively uh, change how the character plays, how it works. Uh, and the other thing you have to remember with the fighter, every attack counts because every attack is going to add on to everything else the fighter does. And that is best exemplified with the Battlemaster. Uh, because every attack he does, every swing of that sword or glaive or whatever you're using, can turn into a maneuver which can change the tide of battle. So I hope, uh, I hope you guys really uh, enjoyed this uh, and this really in-depth look uh, mechanically on how to play uh, a fighter. Um, I hope uh, this makes a few more people choose the Battlemaster because it's a really underutilized class. Because again, like the Monk, a lot of people think it's underpowered when in all actuality, it's, it's one of the most powerful classes in the game simply because of how much control it gives you. 
Um, so yeah, uh, let me know in the comments below uh, the next class uh, or archetype or, or whatever if you guys want me to do the fighter archetypes from uh, Xanathar's Guide or the Sword Coast Adventures Guide or anything like that. Let me know. Um, I'm more than happy uh, to do more stuff on the fighter or if you have another class that you want me to do an in-depth guide on, uh, let me know in the comments below. Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, like I said, um, I am trying to do a little bit more Twitch stuff, but this YouTube channel is still important to me. The conversations that we have in the comments and everything are still very important to me, uh, and I still want to reach partner status. So please share this around. Uh, if you haven't yet, please subscribe. I need a thousand subscribers to qualify for partner status again. Uh, and, uh, you know, spread it around, uh, on social media and stuff like that. Um, feel free to spread this on Reddit, uh, on D and D pages where people are discussing stuff. Uh, because again, this is, uh, this is from, uh, someone that, you know, has, you know, a couple thousand hours worth of DM experience and has seen fighters played really, really well and seen them played really, really poorly, uh, over and over and over again. Um, so anyway, that's all for me today and I will see y you guys next time. All right. Bye-bye.